Hello, I'm Phil Svitek, 360 Creative Coach, and I'm very excited to share this episode with you because it is my interview with Amazon Undone's director, Hisko Hulsing. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the show, it's one of my all-time favorites, not just in recent memory, but ever. And to kind of summarize it, it's about this woman named Alma who gets into a car crash and then experiences reality in different ways, ways that we do not. Now, is it because she's losing her mind or because she can actually tap into something that we cannot? That is the question. But at the same time, to deduce it just down to that is a huge disservice because it is a family drama and it also gets down to real human emotion that you know, other shows dream of like getting so deep, or at least I dream of them getting to that level, right? It, it is just so profound. And it does so in a way that's very streamlined, not confusing whatsoever. And it, it truly is a masterclass of execution on every level, script, acting, animation, you know, music, everything. And so, you know, one of the people that helps create that success for the show is, of course, the director, Hisko. Now, if you're unfamiliar with TV, oftentimes the director uh, ends up only doing one episode or maybe a director will do an episode here and there where they'll do multiple episodes, but not consecutively or certainly not all of them, right? It's very rare that the same director does all of the episodes. Well, in this case, so far there have been two seasons and Hisco's directed all of the episodes. And I think that's what creates the streamlined effect, um, you know, in terms of the narrative. And there's a lot of great videos out there already about the process of making Undone. You know, as I said, it is an animated show and it utilizes rotoscope animation where they film it in live action and then Uh, paint over that after the fact and that allows them to really get lifelike performances and put them in any environment that they want so they can film very very quickly it's almost like role playing in in many ways so a lot of that stuff exists out there and i've linked to um, you know my favorite ones down below so you can check that out so my effort with this interview was to get into new territories and that's what you know That's what Hisco and I did, and I truly appreciated his time and willingness to speak with me and to, in many ways, start getting the recognition that he deserves, not just obviously by me, but but just the industry at large, because he's been um, doing this for a a while now, and especially when it comes to animation, you know, it takes years to get to a final product, and so, you know, he's really been at it, and beyond just Undone, he did a segment in in the Sandman, a very popular Netflix show, obviously, uh, you know, the, based off of Neil Gaiman's work, he did this, the animated segment in that called Dream of a Thousand Cats, and he's gotten recognition for that as well, um, you know, more recently. So it's it's really cool to, to see, you know, people get their due, so to speak, and I just wanted to kind of add to that by uh, showcasing, you know, what it really takes So without further ado, here's my interview with Amazon Undone's director, Hisko Hulsing. So let's start with Undone. Uh, I want to, I'm very curious about the script, um, simply because obviously it's such a very visual show. And I'm Mm -hmm. curious how much of that is put into the script itself. How much input do you get to have on that aspect of it? Um, Yeah. Well, the the scripts are usual script so there's most of it is dialogue and then when um there's a lot of strange things happening in Andam, a lot of weird transitions and but usually it says something like and then the room unfolds into its uh, folds into itself you know and i have to figure out what that means <laughs> so that's often uh like that's the fun part also to to try to imagine what that would look like if a room falls into itself, you know? So there's these short descriptions of strange stuff happening. And then I'll just, what I usually do when I get the, got a script for Undone, I would, uh, the first thing I do is I thumbnail the whole script. So I thumbnailed all 3000 shots of the second uh, season, mm-hmm. which means thumbnails are very, rough drawings but because i'm an artist myself and a storyboard artist too 
it is the, the easiest way for me to brief the storyboarders. So that's how we build it up. So I start thumbnailing and then I brief the storyboard and start storyboarding. But then the transitions are are not that precise yet. You know, it's just my first thoughts at, at that moment. Not only transitions, but all the, the, the crazy visual stuff. And then what we usually do is we we would have uh, a meeting with all the supervisors and coordinators of all the departments. And uh, so from the 3D department, the 2D department, you know, the compositors, et cetera. And um, what I would usually do, because I was under so much pressure, uh, not only because I'm, I'm the director and the production designer, but during se the second season, I was also directing uh, Sad Man or the, the Dream of Dust Cats at the same time and all those episodes overlap in a way um so i would usually uh read the script you know think about the transitions uh one hour before those meetings and that put me under so much pressure that when i was talking to those 20 people the ideas just came out of my mind and that was pro i could sort of rely on that that at that moment under that pressure i would come up with with very good stuff usually yeah and so then uh, the next step would be to to have uh, what we call VFX designers uh, make storyboards, especially for the, the special effects and the transitions and the weird stuff, but in a very detailed way so that every department could sort of figure out how much days it would cost them to, the, to, that, to do that particular thing, you know? Yeah, so so having... Yeah. Having sort of watched the behind the scenes making of, there's a huge emphasis on, it seems, the pre-planning, right? Knowing yeah. the spatial relations of when you guys actually film it and things like that. Um, exactly. Does that sort of take out the spontaneity of, you know, being on set with the actors or, you know, I'm just I'm just kind of curious, you know, from their perspective, how, how that no, all No, no, it's for, for the actor. I think during season one, I would always fly to LA to uh, to direct the set. And I was there always with Kate Purdy, who's the showrunner, uh, together with Raphael Boboxberg. But uh, Raphael wasn't always there, but in the beginning he was. And I, I believe it's quite the opposite because all the, um, all the um, preparations are very necessary for any animated film because you don't want to waste time on stuff that you're not going to use. So you have to be very precise and also um make sure that that we don't get in trouble later during the animation process but this way of one, one second this way of working was actually freeing the actors because they were in um in the beginning they were playing kind of an office and later uh, we hired uh, green screen studios and they they don't have to wait for the sets to be built up or anything. They could just do their acting all day long without too much interruption. So for them, it was, I think Rosa Salazar once said that for her, it was like doing a play for 12 hours in a row. Yeah. You know, and, and because, and I was a little bit, I, I, both Rosa Salazar and Bob Odenkirk told me uh, that I thought, thought I was a good director. And I was a bit surprised because, not because I don't think I'm a good director, but because you know, doing such a huge production was my first time. I, I always did my own films, but it was on a smaller scale. But I think what they, what Rosa told me was that I'm so well prepared that they feel very comfortable. They they don't get nervous because sometimes in Hollywood they work with, with directors who are not so clear about what they want or who seem to be a bit nervous about what they're doing. And I'm not because we're so well prepared that. Actually, during the second season, it became even a bit boring <laughs> to direct because, because yeah, I can't tell you why because it was during the pandemic, and I couldn't fly to LA, so I had to direct all eight episodes uh, remotely from here, from Amsterdam, with this mm -hmm. nine-hour time difference. So I was sitting here on this same exactly same spot with five monitors: our know, camera A, camera B, previous stream, uh, storyboard, script. And just sit there for 13 hours, making sure that uh, that the people on the set knew what they were doing. Yeah. So, and and we were so well prepared that even better than during season one, that it became uh, boring. Sounds boring, but uh, <laughs> it was kind of uh, 
you know, everybody, it was like a, a very well oiled machine. And for the actors, yeah. it, it was maybe it was even more fun. The, the downside of it was there could only be two actors maximum on the set because of mm-hmm. pandemic uh, regulations. Uh, so that was hard. Sometimes they had to, like Bob Odenker did most of the scenes alone and talking to puppets, you know. And, wow, that's and incredible. It that was also very well. So every time we had to redo a shot, the cameras had to be on exactly the same position and that could be two three days later or two weeks later so that were was they playing thing. off of video um like a, they what, would no yeah, they like, would no they, they, we would sorry i'm sorry we would set up uh or not we i, I was here you know but uh patrick metcalf and nick ferrero uh the dop they would set up hats on sticks as i call them uh, that would match with the previous so if there was a table scene with five people, it was actually, if you see the green screen stuff, it's actually Bob Odenkirk talking to to those heads on sticks, you know? Can yeah. you imagine it? Yeah. I mean, I can imagine it, but here, here's the interesting part to me. It's, yeah. it's kind of twofold. Number one, um, you know, I've heard Rosa talk about it. Like, this is the most acting she's ever done. I mean, when you talk about like a 12-hour day, it's yeah. like nonstop, you know, whereas most, yeah. you know, as you're talking about, they set up the lights and you have so much downtime generally. Um, yeah. So that's one aspect of it. And and part of it is also a lot of it is emotional. Right. So I'm curious from that perspective, you know, um, I guess like their stamina of not draining them. And especially if they're doing it solo, that chemistry to, to be able to go to that depth of, you know, true human emotion. I mean, it really captures very deep stuff. So um, it's it's a miracle that it, it works so well in my mind yeah for me too but i think i think they're all incredible actors that that's one thing that i notice and i would say they're all very good but with rosa salazar i was completely intimidated by her she's <laughs> i mean I actually we me and kate we we got how to say it hysterical laugh is that the right word when you can yeah. stop one yeah. time when rosa just started crying out of the blue and she was very annoyed by it which i completely understand but we couldn't help it because we are sitting at those monitors and it's like that shit and she bursts out in tears i mean she's incredible i think she's she should be way more famous than she is i mean she's so good i agree i mean i I think she's super talented i mean for me the balance of her to be able to i mean obviously it starts with the script but that sort of snarkiness and just the speed at which she does it like I i think it just and yeah. also what I noticed with her is that she has su- such a big pa- palette. Is that the right word? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a-, a big palette of, of possibilities and emotions. So she could do, you know, a shot in, in many different ways that is necessary or, or if she thought it was necessary. And to me, that was the like sort of a strange um, discovery is that, you know, I'm a painter and I also compose music. I make music, I, I direct stuff, I animate. So, but we always need instruments. You need a, a, you know, you need a brush and you need your paint in your canvas. And I found out with uh, with those actors and especially with Rosa is that, you know, her instrument is her um, her body and her soul and her mind. And that also makes it, so they're so much in control over all of that. That makes them also a bit um, weird yeah. <laughs> to hang out with. <laughs> because if they're really good, you cannot tell if they're acting or if they're not acting. I couldn't tell if Rosa was always... Then I, I got to know her later, especially after second season. I ha- hang out with her on South by Southwest and uh, in Los Angeles. And then I got to know her much better. I, I really like her. I always liked her. And I, I like them, them all, actually. But talking about the, the emotions, yeah, well, I think I was um, surprised by it too, how, how well that worked. And, and the same with Angelica Brawl in season two, it was amazing, you know. The, it, but yeah. I think they just, they used their, their imagination when they read the script. Yeah. And when they are in a scene uh, where the, the emotional, stuff is the core of the scene then it doesn't matter what the set looks like they're in that scene playing with another actor and they're not being distracted by a lot of people hanging around because it it was quite a small crew but i think you should ask them actually i I think i was surprised by how how well that worked and i i think that in a way they 
maybe they enjoyed the second season even better because there was a smaller crew. It was more efficient. I think, I mean, for me, season two, I think what I appreciate it, it really expands where it's a family story, right? The first one um, is, is really about um, Alma, but, and obviously her father, but I think, you know, the second season with the mother and, and, and um, of course the sister, and then, you know, even the kind of the surprise reveal, um, you know, of of what's there, I think, uh, I think plays really well. And I want to ask you this, um, you know, when, when you talk about like the confidence do you, not that I think the actors need to know this, but like, do you know, um, like what's real and what's not? Like, do you have those conversations with Kate and and like, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, he, of course, many times. You know? <laughs> and 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 the, I think we all agreed that uh, nobody knows. We don't know. We don't mm-hmm. know what's real, what's not real, and that that was the best way to approach it. For me, so. Um, uh, as Kate always said, like I'm more interested in in raising questions than giving answers, you know, and that's what Undone is about. But to be honest, for me, especially in this first season, um, the emotional core of everything was uh, her probably being uh, schizophrenic or at least psychotic, which is something that hits close to me uh, personally. So during the when i did the director's cut of every episode for me that was like the emotional core is the right word i think Mm -hmm. so so and in the second season it was i mean i don't want to give spoilers but it remains uh ambiguous but it doesn't seem to be ambiguous because the whole family is uh, involved in the first seven episodes you know or eight yeah like i mean that to me is the artistry and I'm, 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 you know, for, for so long, I, I'm like trying to deconstruct it for myself of like, why does it work so well? Because as, as you're saying, like it does raise many, many questions and they don't necessarily yeah. get answered. And yet it's still so satisfying. And I think, you know, to me, that is the beauty of why I absolutely love, you know, undone in that way. Um, because again, I, I can't personally describe why it works. I just know that it does. And, you know, um, I always feel in good hands, you know, when people say to me of like, oh, I don't know, season one was so perfect. I don't know if I want to start season two. I'm like, no, yeah. it goes in places and it, and it pays off. You have to. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I was a bit concerned about season two because it's such so different. But as Kate and Rafael said, like, we don't want to go on the same path. It, it, it would be tiring for the audience. And I think they're right. But it sort of it worried me a little bit in the beginning because I was like, well, if everybody's into it, then we're telling the audience that they all have superpowers, you know, and how. Uh, so I don't know if everyone goes with it. Some people think it's better than the first season. Some some people think it's not as good. You know, um, to me, it's like a more second season is technically and aesthetically it's on a higher level, level than the first season. The first season is a bit more emotional for me personally, but um, it does all work. Yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. And also, you know, somebody told me like, uh, and at first I took it as an insult. Uh, It was an interviewer and he said, yeah, it's, you know, it's deep, but it's also uh, snappy and snacky. (laughs) And I was like, yeah, that's, that's true. In a way, when I started thinking about it, like there's always humor to it. It's very fast. It's not, I mean, it, it is complicated at its core, but it is very easy to understand. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not like Memento from Christopher Nolan where you, you get a headache because you can not wrap your head around it. It's sort of the story moves ahead and, and you go along with it. And that, yeah. in, especially in the first season, that was my main uh, like concern as a director is to take the people into Rosa's head, you know, to have the journey with her. And uh, the first thing that I showed Kate and Raphael when they when we met for the first time was the dream sequence for, from uh, Rosemary's Baby, you know, from Polanski, mm-hmm. because I thought that film was was kind of the way we should approach it, where you you are with her all the time, and uh, as an as a viewer, you're not sure what's real and what's not real. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to ask. So this kind of ties into you. Um, one of the things that you talk about is this idea of um, also getting away from the art itself and just experiencing life. And you know, you like to try new things. 
Um, how has that benefited you? Because this show deals with a lot of cultures, right? So were you, you know, um, was there like a research element for you to like dive into, you know, what it's presenting? Certainly, um, you know, just the native cultures that it does draw from. I think that that's that comes more from Kate, actually. She's very interested in indigenous cultures and and also she's very like <laughs> um she's very much in, into things like alternate alternative healing. She went to India to help heal people. And so in a way, and you know, I was a little bit she gave an interview in The Guardian uh in April or something where she said something like yeah, I really believe that uh, our ancestors are reaching out to us. And I was like, oh, no, don't say that, because I, I, I think the whole thing on that is that you're not sure about that. It could be, could be, could be her imagination, you know. So but she's sort of more on the spiritual side than Raphael or me. I'm, I'm, I, I like to be uh, down to the ground. How do you say that? Yeah. With yeah. feet on ground. Yeah. Did, yeah. So I, the, the way, it, you know, it, it takes place in Mexico, of course. So from my you know directors and production designers standpoint we just have to do research into mexico city how that looks like and Kate did you travel down there or no or no <laughs> i didn't no and then there's the whole um the the yiddish uh, little town in uh, episode seven of, of the second season yeah uh well it's you can get all the re you know you can do all the research online most of it you can just find how how um how such a village would look like and uh there was um a historian in jewish history uh who would help us with all the details you know mm -hmm. so tell us what what was unrealistic in in such a village in 1939 for instance but i didn't go there you know i also did animation for um Kurt Cobain, Montage of Heck, was a film by Brett Morgan about Kurt Cobain. And uh, half of that story took place in Aberdeen. And uh, a lot of people from Aberdeen reached out to me. How, how did, have you lived there? How did you know that Aberdeen was such a shithole? <laughs> and I said, well, I just looked it up and it's raining and it's pretty ugly. So it was not hard to get all my information from there. But I don't need to travel. I mean, I travel a lot, but I don't need to go to Mexico City to to have our paint steam paint uh mexico city as it is you know yeah i think uh, as far as content goes I, I i work from the script and uh kate does all the research into the details of um indigenous cultures and actually do you remember the the native american from uh the first season the, the indian the one, guy who, yeah who walks up to her yeah yeah He's actually a friend of her, and um, he came all the way from Mexico to to the set on LA to do that. Uh, oh, that's acting. amazing! And uh, what he also did is, the, do you remember the mask in the second season, the, the Aztec mask? Yeah, he yeah. made it. He made it. It's beautiful. So it's, it's oh, like wow. it looks like a, like a museum piece, and he made it especially for Kate and for the show, and it was used uh, on the set. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, I think I think Kate is very um, precise in making sure that everything is authentic. So, um, as we sort of wrap out, I, I want to ask you: What sort of books would you recommend to people? And it could be, you know, interpret as you may. It can be an art concept book. It can be a, a nonfiction book. It could be a fiction book. Like just whatever sort of you think would be oh. awesome for people to check out. Yeah. Oh, that's well. Yeah, I read so many books, so I don't know. It's very hard. This question. What's the yeah. what's what's the latest books that you've read? Um, well, science fiction from Stanislav Lem. You know uh -huh. Stanislav Lem? Yeah, I, I actually don't, but you don't, but you know Solaris, the Tarkovsky film, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's based on a book from uh, Stanislav Lem, and it's it's very philosophical science fiction, and I would like to to make a film out of one of his books. So that was the last thing I, I read. But I, I'm not going to say the title because people will steal it from me. <laughs> uh, well, and, and, and yeah, that's a good question. You know, I, I learned directing from, you know, I, I took this advice from uh, P.T. Anderson because he's about two years older than I am. 
And when Boogie Nights, Boogie Nights came out, he was only 27 or something, or 26. And I was I was blown away. And he, he said something, and he didn't do film school at all. He was just watching uh, as many films as he could and reading books about it, you know, and just doing it. And I took that advice. So I, I, I've been watching thousands of films and watching them twice on a day, you know, to analyze it and see. And that's how I learned it. And of course, I, I read all the books like, story from Robert McKee and you know things like that and all autobiographies from from directors to to see how they're thinking but to mention just one book would be kind of impossible for me no uh, worries no worries yeah um, but I, I appreciate like um you know I heard you talking about just the idea for animators you know part of if they want to succeed it's just get your work out there uh, yeah, exactly. and I, I think you know when we talk about books, I think it can sometimes be easy, like film books, especially, you know, diving too deep into it, but never making something. And you know, I think having the knowledge of a craft is certainly important, but also yeah. you got to eventually take that first step and just go for it. Yeah, you got to do it, and and then you find, and then you make a lot of mistakes, and um, and you fail all the time. You know, one of my my favorite. Um, uh, quotes is from uh, Frank Zappa, who is my all time hero. And, and he said something like, You know, people are so cranked up about success because it's so rare. Uh, people fail like 95% of the time. So get used to it, you know. And that that was always my that helped me a lot in my career because I it's okay if you fail. I mean, you shouldn't fail on a set in Hollywood. I mean, I, <laughs> although it does happen once in a time, but but not very much actually. But it, it took a long time before I got there, you know, and I, I made a lot of mistakes and I made a bad move. My first film was horrible. So there's nothing wrong with that, you know, and, and I just keep on progressing. Um, but that, that question, geez, I, 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 no, I don't have a real answer to that. No worries. No worries. I think we got no. to a much deeper answer. Yeah, and, and also, also, I would like to mention that that you know, people who have just one book are mostly religious. You know, <laughs> yeah, they, they need people for their love. I, I would say read as much as possible. You know, that's probably a better advice. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Here's a fun one. What what are the scenes that you love working on the most in Undone? Is it the intimate ones or the ones that are kind of more you know action based? Like the typical one that I see is. Alma running through the the hallway of the hospital in season yeah, one. Yeah, that, well, exactly that one, and that was during the first shooting week where where we were just still finding things out. But I remember in the second episode, there's this exactly this scene that I was just talking about, where it says in the script, and then the room unfold unfolds into itself or something, and we had to figure out how to do that, and we ended up with with an extra jumping on a not a very spectacular trampoline and 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 just making sure that the camera was in such an angle that it looked more spectacular than it was etc and and i remember my, me and kate saying to each other wow wow so great that we get paid to do this you know <laughs> to, to to sort of you know it was all kind of guerrilla filmmaking it's never uh you know on the set it was always a little bit low budget i mean we had a small crew and um, and all those effects where, where we had to film them first with the actors. So we had to think of very, you know, practical, smart things. So, so for instance, if they're, the three of them are standing next to each other and I, I figured out that the camera had to move all around, uh, all the way around them, that was not possible because we filmed it uh, with three actors on three different days. And we cannot move the camera like that in, in the way we work. So I just had to make them turn around and then it looked like they were <laughs> the camera was, uh, moving around. So all those kind of, I, I love to these kind of puzzles where you have to find out how you make something work. I, I think the, the Daniels have the same thing with um, yeah. everything everywhere all at once. I, I realized that I was blown away by that film and I, was, I realized that they are working on exactly the same way. Just most things are just in camera kind of stupid tricks in a way you know, yeah people... i mean i i would um like part of my goal is to study magic more for that specific yeah. reason because i think magic and filmmaking are you know yeah. i mean people always say the magic of filmmaking right so clearly yeah. there's a symbiosis there 
Yeah, yeah, it's it's movie magic, and it, it is, and it is magic because it's uh, not real magic. It's a bunch of tricks, of course. But I remember during Undone that we we did move doors, you know, people moving doors, as in Plan Nine from outer space, you know, from it yeah. was the same kind of thing. But we knew that we would that it would look fantastic once animated, you know. So it's all yeah, practical tricks and uh, yeah. Love Question it. for you. So um, James Cameron says never use the same trick twice because the audience yeah. starts to see it. Do mm -hmm. you agree with yeah. that? Yeah, totally. I, I mean, if you look at uh, that was one of the challenges or the fun was to make every transition look different. I, I thought we should. I mean, maybe there are a couple that are similar, but there were so many of them uh, during two seasons that we always tried to find out new things, new ways to, yeah. to show it because the script was not very specific about it most of the time. So I, that was, I think, the fun part for me. And then the other fun part is, of course, that when I made my own films, like my short films, I was doing almost everything myself. And I was very skeptical of delegating so much to, because we had, for Undone, we had like 200 people working on it. So, but that turned out to be also a fun part where, you know, people come up with stuff that's better than what you could think of, or they, they make a shot better than you could ever have imagined, you know? So at the end of the day, I would get in all, all this material to a review and that was like getting presents for my birthday sometimes. <laughs> like, well, I didn't even do anything, and it's there, it's finished, you know. Yeah. So that, that's another great part that, that you that I realized for the first time that you know I used to think that uh, big productions or Hollywood productions were dumbed down by all the different people working on it, and I found out that they get much better because you have so much more brains who are yeah. uh, working on the same film, and even. Like executives, not even, but I mean, you would think that uh, people from Amazon would interfere in in bad ways, but they, they would also, you know, come up with, with smart uh, ideas. So, yeah, and I think, I mean, if the spirit is there, right, towards making yeah. a project as good as it can and, yeah, yeah you know. I think yeah, that's, that, really that's it. You, know, you have to, you have to, I, I think with Undone, I don't know, did you see the Sandman episode, Dream Without Us Kids? Did um, I, I, I did not know. Oh, we didn't. I should see it. This is the 11th episode of The Sad Man on Netflix. It, it uh, just got, yeah. uh, doesn't he just got it's nominated not... for the uh, Annie Award. Yeah, for... Annie. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, thank you. But it was partly the same team. Only a small part, by the way. And, um, you know, everybody working on that and also everybody working on Undone was so, um, was realizing that we work, were working on something very special. So that makes it so much fun because when you're working on a commercial, it's very different. A lot of people yeah. are like, yeah, yeah, tell me what to do, you know? <laughs> and yeah. that's not that's not the attitude of people working on Dunn. They they are all they all want it to be as good as possible. And that, that was beautiful, you know. So I'm kind of nostalgic about it, melancholic. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, truly thank you and truly congratulations to you and the team. Um, I think, yeah. I will forever praise Undone as... I oh, mean. thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, I love it too.